Well, I want to thank everyone for joining us this evening for our presentation, our expert education series. Um, this evening, we will be hosting a presentation with Dr. Wendy Bameter from the Clean Hospital in Boston. So before we get started, I just want to let you know that I am Doreen Heinemann. I'm the program manager here at the Sash Bear Foundation in Canada. And I am joined by one of our volunteers, Barb, who will be helping me out behind the scenes, and by our co-founder, Lynn Corey. Um, the Sash Bear Foundation is a registered charity in Canada, and we do work around the area of emotion dysregulation, um, suicidality, and family involvement and engagement in those issues. Um, so as I mentioned, we're a registered charity, and so most of our efforts are provided through the efforts of our volunteers, and most of our funding comes from donations from individuals like you. So I encourage you to check out our website website at sashbear.org. Find out a little bit more about what it is that we do. And uh, if you feel moved to help us out with our mandate in any way, we always accept donations and we are always welcoming of new volunteers. Um, for this evening's presentation, it's being offered in webinar format. And what that means is that your microphones are automatically muted and your cameras are automatically turned off. So that means that you don't need to worry about interrupting us. You can have your dogs barking or you can be eating your dinner and it will not bother us. Please make yourselves comfortable while you are listening to this presentation. So with that, I would like to welcome this evening's presenter, Wendy Bameter. Um, she is um, a licensed clinical psychologist who specializes in dialectical behavior therapy for adolescents and young adults. And she is currently the program director at McLean Hospital's Three East Cambridge residence. Is that the right title, your current position, Wendy? <laughs> It is. You got it. Great. Thank you. In addition to working with individuals who struggle with pervasive emotion dysregulation and high risk behaviors, Dr. Bameter is also committed to providing affirming care to LGBTQIA plus individuals and their families. She also has extensive training in delivering culturally sensitive individual and family therapy in Spanish. Her research and teaching background focuses on improving mental health interventions for underserved communities, including monolingual Spanish-speaking immigrants, transgender and non-binary individuals, and African Americans in community mental health settings. As a therapist, she likes to balance mindfulness, warmth, and humor with change-oriented interventions. And I must say that since I've met her, this idea of mindfulness, warmth, and humor really seems to ring true. She is absolutely delightful. And we're so pleased to have her here with us tonight. I will just mention that after the presentation, after the formal presentation, we will be able to take some questions. So you can use either the chat or the Q&A function to put your questions in. If you want to pose a question anonymously, please post it in the Q&A where you have the option to post it anonymously. And we won't be able to answer all of the questions. So we, we will be uh, sort of screening through them and answer the ones that are of the most general interest um, and the most focused on tonight's topic. Um, and as Dr. Bameter will explain, we also can't answer any specific individual questions to help you out with specific situations, but we can generalize um, the responses for you. So with that, um, I would like to turn it over to Dr. Bameter. Thank you so much for joining us this evening and sharing your time and your expertise with us. It is my pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. It feels very exciting um, to be here. My colleagues at Three East have sung your praises for years and years, ever since I was a postdoc at Three East. So it's nice to be here. Um, so tonight I'm gonna to be talking about supporting sexual minority youth. Um, that is part of the work that we are really focused on doing at Three East. And it's something I've been focused on for a long time. Um, a few things that I want to mention. I'll be talking specifically about sexual minority youth tonight, so LGB youth, lesbian, gay, bisexual youth, um, focusing more on the sexual orientation piece. And then on February 1st, we'll be talking about working with trans and non-binary folks. And obviously, there's some overlap. The research doesn't always distinguish between these groups, um, but the focus tonight is on sexual minorities. And if you're like, hey, what about trans and non-binary folks? We will talk more about them on um, February 1st. So I hope to see you there as well. Um, okay, let's get started.
Okay, so a quick overview. Um, we will first start, I'd like to just sort of frame the presentation. So we'll start with some good old fashioned DBT, um, talking about some skills and agreements that I think are helpful for everybody to keep in mind throughout the presentation. We'll do some psychoeducation about LGBTQ folks, uh, specifically really actually focusing on sexual minority youth or LGB folks. Then we'll get into mental health uh, risk and protective factors, looking at some of the data. And I'll let you write, I'll let you know right now that most of the data that I have is, is really on US populations. However, just in you know, taking a look at some of the research on um, statistics in Canada, it does seem like there's a lot of overlap. Uh, so I hope that it's still helpful to you. And then finally, we'll get into tips. How can we help you help um, your sexual minority youth loved ones, whether you're a parent, a grandparent, um, extended family, coaches, teachers, you're all really, really important. You play a really important role in these kids' lives. Um, so we'll talk about some, some concrete suggestions and then I'll connect you with some resources. All right, and because so many of you speak DBT, as I mentioned, we'll sprinkle some DBT in here um, as we go. All right. So when I think about teaching folks around sexual minority or gender minority um, topics, one of the things I like to always think about are actually incorporating some DBT agreements and skills to frame our time together, to frame maybe the way that we're thinking and receiving the information. Because these topics can actually be really difficult for a number of reasons. They can be difficult because they can be deeply personal. People in the audience, I'm sure there's people in the audience who identify as queer. Um, there, it might be personal because you have loved ones who are really struggling, or you have family members who are not accepting, or you yourself are actually really struggling to accept somebody you love deeply who also holds an LGBTQ identity. And so one of the things I want you to work on tonight, um, if you're open to it, is just practicing some self-validation. If the material feels difficult, um, if you're feeling overwhelmed, if you're feeling a lot of different emotions, I think just stopping and noticing like and practicing some self-validation, like this is hard stuff. Makes sense that I'm experiencing a bunch of different emotions um, during this talk, that's completely normal. Um, the next one is really trying to practice non-judgment. And we wanna practice non-judgment of ourselves and of the material, maybe even of me. So with the non-judgment piece, I might say, hey, here are some things you could do. Here are some things I would avoid doing. It's very likely that we've all done things that we actually should have avoided doing. That's okay. We're human. And so I hope in those moments, you really don't beat yourself up. You practice non-judgment um, and sort of allow yourself to just learn how to do better moving forward. Um, I also think that when we become really judgmental, our thinking gets so much more closed and inflexible and actually prevents us from learning. And so that's another way, another reason to sort of throw out the presentation, just notice like, oh, judgment's coming up using that mindfulness, judgment's coming up. And this is really important when you're working with um, or interacting with queer youth, if you feel judgment coming up in these circumstances, noticing, not just acting on the judgment, but noticing, hey, I'm, I'm noticing some judgmental thoughts coming up and then we can slow down. The third one I want us to keep in mind is this concept of fallibility. We are all fallible. And we talk a lot about that in DBT. What that means is we all make mistakes. I make mistakes, you make mistakes, we all make mistakes. And that's okay, that's part of being human. And so with the fallibility agreement, just accepting that we're all fallible allows us to take a much more non-defensive stance. So if somebody accuses us of saying something that, oh my God, like that was actually homophobic, or, hey, that's actually not the language we use anymore. Instead of getting defensive, just allowing us to say, oh, okay, excellent, thank you, and move on. Um, so practicing that fallibility is, is important tonight. And then my favorite, which I imagine so many of you are familiar with, is um, the agreement and the idea that we all keep in mind that we are doing the best we can at any given moment with the skills and the knowledge that we have with the vulnerabilities that are at play. Um, we not, may not be doing phenomenally and we're doing the best we can. And so I think when you're thinking about your past selves or mistakes you've made in the past, I hope you can hold that, that you did in the past the absolute best you could and you're here potentially to do better. And that's the dialectic that we're always trying to balance, right? I'm doing the best I can and what can I do to do better? And part of that is learning and being able to self-reflect. 
So I hope those are helpful for you to keep in mind tonight. All right, LGBTQ 101. Um, many of you have, have heard so many different terms uh, when we're talking about the queer community or the LGBTQ community. It used to actually be referred to as just the gay community, and that was meant to encompass a lot of people, clearly for, for clear reasons that didn't feel very inclusive. And so folks across time incorporated it to the LGBT community, then the LGBTQ plus community. You heard uh, Doreen in her presentation, I, I refer to it as the LGBTQIA community. And then you've got this acronym, which I have to admit is even hard for me to say out loud. I will try though, LGBTQQIP2SAA. There we go, I got it. Um, and this is where, you know, if you hear me talking about this acronym and listing it out loud, I think judgments can come up like, oh my gosh, when is it enough? Like people can have these judgments. And I just really encourage you when you have those judgments to just like get curious about where they're coming from. So um, this, this sort of very long acronym here, the idea is it's more inclusive. It's more inclusive of the many different orientations that people might hold. And so many folks, when you're just thinking about LGB are getting left out from that community. And so here, here is the long list on the left. And if you're looking for just a different video of um, explaining these different um, terms, there's a, you'll get a copy of the slides if you ask for it, but this is a really great uh, video that you can watch. So I'm gonna focus on a few with you, um, sort of to clarify the ones that people have more questions about. So everything I've moved to the right, that's for February 1st. We'll talk about that on February 1st. And then we're left with the ones on the left. And the ones that I think people feel the most confused about are right here. So bisexual, you may not think that's very confusing, but one thing I wanna highlight there when we're talking about folks who identify as bisexual, in the past, oftentimes we thought about bisexual folks as being attracted to both sexes, right? As people are talking about actually like sex and gender are much more non-binary than we, we initially talked about or acknowledged. Um, people really are talking about bisexuality as, as truly being attracted to more than one gender or sex. And I think that's important because if you're thinking just of both sexes, that can come across as kind of transphobic um, or really not inclusive to folks who identify as non-binary. And, and certainly that is not the case when somebody identifies as bisexual. Um, the next one is queer. Queer, of course, some of you might hear that word and have strong reactions to it because of the way that it was used pejoratively in the past. And, and that's changed. People have reclaimed the word queer. And the word, I will just say, means so many different things. So that's that's one thing I want you to keep in mind. But generally when, and I'll use the word queer throughout the presentation as well. When we're talking about a queer identity, oftentimes the umbrella term we're referring to is anyone whose sexual or gender orientation isn't exclusively heterosexual or cisgender. So for those of you who don't know what the word cisgender means, that means that your sex assigned at birth aligns with your gender identity. So it's it's not being transgender, it's not non-binary, it's um, cisgender, sort of same, um, there's a sameness there. And so because queer, and honestly, a lot of other terms mean so many different things to different people, one thing I would really encourage you to do when youth are talking to you, or really anybody is talking to you and they disclose their identity and they say like, hey, I identify as, as queer or pansexual or demisexual, something you've never heard of before. I encourage you to say, oh, like, thanks so much for telling me. I know that means a lot of, or I know that can mean a lot of different things to different people. Can you tell me more about what that means to you? And then you don't need to make any assumptions or you don't need to go back to these PowerPoint slides. You can just be human in the moment, be vulnerable and ask for a little bit more information. And generally at adolescence in, in the right context, really love to explain a little bit more and teach you. Um, questioning. I think everybody understands what that means. It means somebody who's questioning their sexual or gender orientation. The, re the reason I have it on this slide though is because folks who are questioning often get left out. When, they, when we think about LGBTQ folks, we don't often include folks who are questioning. And that can lead people to feel isolated, excluded, um, and actually have poor mental health outcomes. So when somebody comes out even as questioning or discloses that they're questioning their sexual or gender orientation, you wanna lean in, you wanna pay attention, you wanna get curious about what that means. Um, folks who are questioning deserve just as much attention and love as, as everybody else. Um, a term you've all probably heard a lot more of in most in more recent years is the idea of uh, pansexuality. 
Um, broadly, it's it means being attracted to all genders or sexes. But again, that's one where I'd say like, hey, can you tell me what that means for you? And then asexuality. Folks who identify as asexual are very often left out. Um, and these folks are people who typically experience little to no. So it's not always no sexual attraction, but little to no sexual attraction to other people. And I think it's important for us to distinguish between romantic attraction and sexual attraction. People who are um, asexual may still have very strong romantic feelings for some people, and that's important to acknowledge. Um, you might sometimes hear people use the word ace or like I'm an ace or talking about aces. Um, that's usually referring to people who are asexual. Okay. And so the Trevor Project is this wonderful organization um, that does incredible work with the LGBTQ community. There's a big focus on suicide prevention and they um, do national surveys of, of queer folks across the country, across the United States. And um, one of their bazillion findings of their national survey were that LGBTQ youth were using over a hundred different terms to describe their sexual orientation. And I'll tell you right now, I don't know what every single, I know what a lot of these mean, but I, do, I actually don't know what every single one of these mean. And so again, just staying curious and, and learning more and more as we go, um, you're on the right track if you're open to doing that. Um, and actually, I just wanna go back to here for one second. Just because we have what seems like a bazillion terms to describe sexual orientation, it doesn't mean that new sexual orientations are being developed. It's that people across time are developing more specific nuanced language to describe their, their attraction, their orientation. And that's generally, we think a very good thing. In DBT, we focus so much on really being accurate and specific about your emotional experience. And we know that actually spending time identifying what specific emotion are you feeling versus like, I feel like crap, or I'm in a shitty mood, excuse my, my language, being able to say, I'm really sad, I'm feeling incredibly embarrassed, actually can help us regulate our emotional experience. So I don't know the research on this, but it's kind of interesting, at least when we're talking about emotions, the emotional benefit, the mental health benefit of getting more granular is a really good one. And so it may be really, really powerful for folks to be able to have more specific labels to, um, to describe their sexual orientation and gender orientation. And then finally, we've got allies who are an incredibly important um, part of the longer LGBT acronym. Um, and, and we'll talk more about your role um, and how, how important you can be. An ally is somebody who doesn't consider them to be part of the um, queer community, however, is committed to fighting for equal rights, to affirming people's identity, to standing against biphobia, transphobia, homophobia. And so my hope is that folks who are here are really open and wanting to be allies or already are amazing allies and wanting to continue to do better. I certainly always want to do better. Okay, so I think when we're thinking about uh, the young people that we love and their coming out process, sometimes we can sort of just simplify it in our minds and we think, oh, you have like sexual attraction to people and then you come out. And actually like it's a lot more complicated. There are so many stages and milestones that people are reaching. And when you're reaching them at adolescence, I just wanna highlight that's complicated because adolescents already have so many other developmental milestones that they're working through. And we know from, from data that youth actually are coming out earlier and earlier. And so their adolescent developmental milestones are coinciding with all of these developmental milestones, which just means a lot is happening for them and there's a lot to negotiate and figure out. Um, so uh, Hall is a researcher who did, um, I believe it was a meta-analysis of a bunch of different studies of people's coming out and sort of uh, sexual identity developmental milestones and um, performed some analyses to see sort of what is the general like gist of the sequence. And it absolutely varies. It does not always go in this order, but I think it can be helpful to know this is a common or one of the most common sequence uh, sequences of, of events for folks who are coming to um, learn about uh, their, their own sexual orientation and to, and to act on it. And so first it's becoming aware of queer orientation and there's an average of this happening around 13 years old. And all of these numbers vary to some extent by race, by sexual orientation, by gender and sex. Um, 
So for example, uh, lesbian and gay folks tend to be more aware of their queer attractions earlier than bisexual folks. Um, men tend to be more aware earlier than, than women. Um, I think it is Black and Hispanic groups tend to uh, develop that awareness and actually come out earlier than white and Asian groups. Um, so it's really interesting. This is this is a wonderful article if you if you're interested in all of this. But we've got becoming aware of queer attractions, questioning one's orientation, then coming to self-identify, right? And there take, there's like some bravery that's involved there. Like, okay, I'm going to do it. I'm going to choose a label, or some people may not choose a label, and that's fine too. Then they might start engaging in sexual activity, and oftentimes you come out after that, after experimenting a little bit. That's not always true, um, but that's that's some of what the research supports. And then finally, getting to this place where you can have a romantic relationship. And one of the big things I want to highlight here is there's there's a big gap, right, in between when somebody becomes aware of queer attractions and then comes out. So you've got 13 all the way to 19, 20. So that means, theoretically, that a lot of people are silent, right? Or in the closet, as some people say, or just not, not um, sharing their true authentic selves with everybody for a whole host of reasons, some of which are uh, extremely probably protective and, and safe. But there's a lot going on for people before they come out. And I think that's important to know. All right. So we're going to dive into mental health risk and protective factors. Some of this data can be upsetting. Um, it can feel really grim. I want to highlight a couple things. One um, is that even though generally we see mental health rates, uh, mental health disparities, mental health problems are, are much, much worse for LGBTQ, um, LGBTQ youth, um, it doesn't mean that every queer youth has mental health challenges. So I really want you to keep that in mind. Um, the numbers are way higher than we'd like, and that doesn't mean everybody has these challenges. The other piece is we have really good research on some of the protective factors, which can, I hope, like mobilize us to continue to do better and to act on these protective factors. And then when we're seeing risk factors to say, oh my goodness, I know this is a risk factor. What can I do about it? How can I pay attention to this? Some risk factors are modifiable and, and some aren't, um, like race isn't, um, whereas bullying, it's like, okay, we can do something about the bullying or try to. All right, the other piece is a lot of the research shows that even though mental health challenges are, are really prominent in youth and adolescents and, and young adulthood, they do get better slowly across time. And so that's another really, really important piece to remember. All right, so I'm not going to go through every single uh, data point here, and this isn't a comprehensive review, but for those who want to see the data, here is some of it. Um, and I'll just, on this slide, just highlight the ones I'd like to share more with you and talk a little bit more about. Um, so starting with depression, we know that bisexual youth, and, and this is true not just for depression, but a number of mental health challenges, bisexual youth really, really, really struggle. And it's interesting because I think we don't think about bisexual folks nearly as much as we might think about gay folks, lesbian folks, trans, non-binary folks. Um, and so just so that everybody can really hear this, right? Bisexual youth, bisexual individuals have much higher rates of mental health distress in a lot of areas. And one of the main reasons for that is I think it's an identity that often feels really invisible. Bisexual people make up the majority of LGBTQ people, and yet still the identity often feels invisible. So for example, if you're a bisexual woman and you're dating a man, everybody's just going to assume you're straight, right? And so that really important identity that you hold, all of a sudden is getting erased on a day-to-day -day experience. And then you have to decide, do I disclose this? Do I not? And, and that's a stressor in and of itself. Um, the other piece is for bisexual folks, oftentimes there's discrimination within and outside of the community, right? So within the LGBTQ community, um, folks can be more discriminatory towards bi folks, um, like pick a side, um, this actually isn't real. Uh, bisexual identity is often invalidated as not being a real thing and it very truly is. Um, and then uh, it's also discriminated against by, by people who identify as heterosexual. And so very important for us to just keep this in mind. It is a vulnerable group of individuals. 
Um, questioning students, like or questioning youth, as, as I mentioned before, are youth that we really do want to pay attention to as well. They've got significantly higher rates of depression than heterosexual students, um, and, and oftentimes even higher than, um, than gay and lesbian youth. Um, not always, but, but that is what some of the research shows. When we're thinking about depression, we want to think about sexual minority youth of color, right? Um, we want to think a lot about intersectionality when we're looking at this data. Intersectionality, referring to Kimberly Crenshaw's um, work, where we're thinking about the intersection of multiple minority statuses and how it how they intersect to oftentimes confer more experiences with discrimination, with prejudice, with victimization, and so it makes sense that mental health rates would be um, oftentimes worse because of that intersection of multiple minority statuses. Um, and so we know um, sexual minority youth of color um, who are endorsing racial discrimination and LGBT, LGB victimization, they do have higher levels of depression. And, and that often happens earlier on in their life. You know, you're exposed to racism at a very early age, unfortunately. Um, and then LGB uh, depression, as I mentioned before, the good news is often declines in young adulthood moving into adulthood. So that's the good news. Um, when we're looking at trauma and PTSD, I think it's just really important to be cognizant of higher rates um, for a lot of LGB folks um, for having experienced traumatic events. Um, you'll see on the next page that uh, victimization rates are high among um, sexual and clearly gender minority youth. And, and that can lead to PTSD. And we really, really want to be vigilant around that. We know that sexual minority youth have much higher rates of um, childhood abuse. And some of that, the theory is that some of that is because, um, or is specifically focused around folks who are gender non-conforming and the judgments um, and, the, and everything that can come with that um, that lead to greater levels of, of childhood abuse, which, which of course often can, can result in uh, PTSD. Um, then looking down lower, questioning college students again at greater risk than most sexual minorities when you're just looking at overall distress level. So we want to pay attention to these folks. All right. And then um, this, this is less mental health and more just like different factors to also pay attention to in terms of things that can impact mental health. We often see greater risk behaviors in sexual minority youth, um, oftentimes as a way to cope with the distress that that they're being that they're experiencing in a world that doesn't always accept them. Um, politics lately have been complicated. Um, they have been for a long time, but certainly in the United States, one of the things we're seeing is um, actually less support for LGBTQ students recently in school, and and kids are feeling the effects of that. Um, so there's some studies that look at um, LGB adolescents in certain parts of the countries where um, people are all about same-sex marriage and there are clear anti-discrimination policies in the school that mention gender and sexual orientation. Um, and the research shows that in these parts of the country, um, there is less victimization, less suicidality, less depressive students among LGBT adolescents than there are in other parts of the country. And I would be shocked if that weren't the case in, in Canada as well. Um, and youth are, are really just noticing current politics impacting their mental health. Um, and so what happens in the news, right? The kids see it, they pay attention. And if there are people out there who are fighting to take away their rights, that's deeply personal. Right, that's a that's a deep affront on your identity, and your sense of safety and belonging in the world, and all of that is is deeply painful and clearly um, likely to impact mental health. And then, you know, when we're looking at violence and victimization, we know the rates are higher for um, for queer youth, and and that is a scary thing and a reason that um, I think we all need to mobilize as much as we can to be the people's um, to be to be um, queer support support um, for queer youth and to advocate for them. All right, what we all worry about the most probably, we've got suicide ideation and behaviors. We know that LGB youth um, and certainly trans youth, and we'll talk about that in, in February, um, but LGB youth are um, nearly five times more likely to attempt suicide than heterosexual peers. 
And then unsurprisingly, based on everything you've learned so far, bisexual teens have even more elevated rates um, of experiencing SI. And then specifically bisexual girls, um, some research has shown that bisexual girls have higher rates of SI compared to bisexual boys. Um, and this Kingsbury study for anybody who's interested um, is, a, is a nationally representative study in Canada looking at um, similar, similar constructs in, um, among LGB youth in, in Canada and are finding very similar, similar findings around suicidality. Um, we know, as we talked about before, there's, there's greater racial discrimination, LGB victimization, or that greater, excuse me, greater racial discrimination and LGB victimization are correlated with higher suicide ideation. And then um, the Treasurer Project did um, this national survey that I mentioned before and broke down suicide attempts among LGB youth in the last year. And what we're seeing here, um, which is consistent with other data who um, among non-LGBT folks too, 31% of Native Indigenous youth um, had attempted suicide in the last year. I mean, that is just astronomically high number. Um, multiracial youth, Black youth, all having higher Latinx youth. Um, this data here is showing white and Asian youth um, attempting suicide at the same rate in the last year. Um, these numbers are all way too high. And I think it's just really important for us to think about the intersection of race and, um, and sexual minority status and, and gender minority status. And then the other, some, some good news here is that suicidality does decline um, across time among sexual minorities as hopefully they're engaging with more factors in their life where that are, that find, that tend to be protective. So in terms of risk factors, we, we know of a ton of risk factors. Uh, Gorse did this study, this, this review of the literature and found sort of these common, uh, these most common risk and protective factors. So one of them is the concept of minority stress, um, which I'll get to on a different slide. The other piece is interpersonal constructs. So some of you might be familiar with Tom, Thomas Joyner's work, um, the interpersonal um, psychological theory of suicide, where Thomas Joyner talked about a couple of factors that, that really, the, the theory is that really increase uh, the, um, an individual's suicidality or desire to die by suicide. And one of those is thwarted belongingness, feeling like you just don't belong. And that I think makes sense to hopefully all of us, how, how that could come up so easily uh, for queer youth. And so we know that LGBT youth have much higher rates of homelessness. They're kicked out of their homes at a higher rate, um, not having family and peer support or feeling rejected by others. These are all ways that the thwarted belongingness can manifest and then secondly, feeling like a burden. Um, certainly, you know, you hear all of this information, you're like, oh my gosh, this is so scary. This is so much. Um, kids see their parents worried, right? Um, I, I would be worried at, at some level. I would be a whole bunch of things, right? Um, but what we want to make sure that we're really careful about is not conveying to the children that they're a burden in any way, right? We want to get them the resources. We want to foster hope, do everything we can. There is so much we can do, um, but really watching to make sure that that we're certainly not sending any signs of, um, of them being a burden on, on us. And of course that can come from other people beside parents um, and oftentimes completely accidentally. Uh, race we saw is, is a risk factor depending on racial identity. Certainly trans identity um, is, a, is a risk factor. So of course people can have a sexual minority status and a trans min or a gender minority status at the same time. Partner, partner violence, homelessness, vi school victimization, lack of school support. School, what happens at school is so unbelievably massive for, for these youth, I, both in a good way and, and in a bad way, depending on, on what's happening at school. And so we really, really want to pay attention to what's happening at school and help support school personnel, administration, to be able to provide as many resources as they can um, and really effective resources to queer youth. And then what are the protective factors? Um, there are a number of really great protective factors. These are just some, um, certainly GSAs. Those used to be referred to as um, gay straight alliances. Now they're called uh, typic more typically gender and sexuality alliances. Having a curriculum in school that is LGBTQ inclusive is, is really important. Having policies that specifically denote um, anti-discrimination among, um, or the importance of, of non-discrimination um, uh, 
regardless of sexual identity, um, gender identity, and, and all sorts of other identities. Having family support, we'll get to that. Peer support, these are both really, really incredibly powerful interventions um, and sources of support. And then of course, mental health interventions. Um, that is all really important. And there are there is a lot of research on culturally adapted interventions uh, for LGBTQ folks. And because all of that was so heavy, um, I want to share this slide, which is also from the Trevor Project, the, the national survey they did. And they asked all of these LGBT youth, like, what brings you joy? And I think this is an absolutely lovely um, depiction of, of what youth, these uh, LGBT youth these days are saying really brings them joy. And when you are with a youth who is struggling, you might look to this list and think together, like, what, what how can we support um, you accumulating more positives for people who want to speak DBT? How can we help you acu more, accumulate more positives um, amidst all this stress going on in your life? Okay, so minority stress theory. This graph is like totally overwhelming. I'm not going to go into it in detail, but I want to highlight that the idea of minority stress theory is everywhere when you're talking about LGBT identity. And so focusing on the LGB part first, and then in February, we'll look at, at the gender piece. Um, Elon Meyer developed this, this theory. Um, and essentially the idea was everybody's exposed to stress in our life and too much stress for all of us, of course, doesn't tend to be a good thing. However, when we're thinking about queer folks, when we're thinking about lesbian, gay, bisexual folks, we need to be mindful that there's actually a specific kind of stress that straight people aren't experiencing. And that's what Ilan Meyer referred to as minority stress. And so he highlighted two categories of minority stress. And sometimes like I'll teach the kids about this and I'll ask them to, when I say the kids, like my patients, um, the, the folks I'm working with, and I'll ask them to rate like how true, how stressful are some of these in your daily life? Uh, let's let's figure out what, what's really causing you the most stress because these aren't going to be relevant for everybody. And so Elon Meyer talked about distal stressors and proximal stressors, distal being the external ones, proximal being what's happening inside of me. So some of the biggest distal minority stressors that we know cause, right, all of those negative outcomes, there's so many of those negative outcomes we just talked about, are experiences with prejudice, experiences with discrimination, of violence, of people not accepting your identity and actually sometimes even doing hateful, um, violent things um, when they're acting on that prejudice. And then what we what we think is that the more of these experiences you have of these distal stressors that you have, likely we're going to likely see more of these internal minority stressors showing up. And so there's three that Ellen Meyer talked about, and one of them is the expectation of rejection. So if you get victimized a certain number of times, it makes sense that you're actually going to continue to expect negative outcomes. And clearly, if we're expecting to be rejected, we're expecting to be hurt, that's going to impact our behavior. We might end up actually not seeking out safe people because we might assume um, that we're going to be hurt. We might actually just isolate. Um, we do a whole bunch of different things based on this expectation of rejection. But this expectation can be really powerfully, um, can, can very powerfully impact our mental health. Concealment of identity. This is a minority stress that people are dealing with all the time. Do I come out? Do I not come out? For some people, it's easier to disclose. For other people, it's not. There are certain very protective elements of concealing your identity. The answer is not always come out, come out. Um, for some people, it's this, the safest thing they can do is conceal their identity. Um, and there are consequences to that. And so some of the research shows when you're concealing your identity, you are experiencing, you are more, more likely to experience anxiety and, and sometimes depression. And then the third one being internalized homophobia. So if you have homophobia coming at you all the time, it makes sense that you're going to start to internalize some of these messages that are being sent your way. And that internalized homophobia just looks like shame, right? Just very intense shame. And in DBT, we think about shame all the time and, and how to treat shame. Um, and we know how, how powerfully shame can impact our mental health and, and suicidality. And so we wanna be thinking about all these minority stressors when we're thinking about the people that we love and care about and what they're experiencing. Um, just to preserve time, I'm not gonna go into much detail on this slide, just more examples of like the way sexual stigma present in the world, um, how they can happen at macro levels, micro levels, um, 
And, and then microaggressions, I just want to highlight for those of you who aren't familiar with the term microaggressions, these are different sort of behaviors that people can engage in, sometimes actually accidentally, um, they're much more covert. Um, sometimes they're described as like death by a thousand cuts, right? It's like, it's a paper cut. A microaggression could feel like a paper cut, but if they're happening all the time, it's not a good look, right? Um, and so microaggressions often convey some kind of hidden message, some biased belief. Um, and for different identity groups, um, there are like very common meta communications, um, implicit messages that are being conveyed when people engage in or say things that that come across as microaggressions. And for LGB folks, oftentimes it's the implication of sin or the implication of perversion. Um, and so we want to be really mindful about how awful that feels um, when when somebody's on the receiving end of it. Um, and it might be something to, you know, depending on where you are with your children, talking to them about the concept of microaggressions and getting curious about their experience with microaggressions. Now, that would depend a lot on where you are um, in your relationship with them and their, their identity, um, their disclosure of their identity. So I hope as I'm talking about this, some of you uh, DBT folks are like screaming like biosocial theory. Oh my God, biosocial theory. Um, the idea being when we're thinking about the biosocial theory and how people come to develop borderline personality disorder or pervasive emotion dysregulation, we tend to think about people who are born emotionally vulnerable. They have this sensitivity, they're born with it, and then they interact with an environment that is incredibly invalidating at multiple levels. And so it makes sense when these two things collide, a really sensitive, vulnerable temperament paired with an invalidating world or the people, the most important people in your life being invalidating, that it can lead to, to severe dysregulation. Um, all right. So we want to practice opposite action to shame. That's very, very important um, for folks who are receiving all of these messages of invalidation and, and internalizing them. One of the things we want to think about is how do we help you build pride, right? That would be opposite action to shame and really trying to foster pride. Um, I just want to say here, families matter so much. The research is scary and incredible, depending on um, the, which way we're looking at it, in terms of how powerfully families can impact um, the mental health of LGBTQ folks. And so I won't go through all of the data, but I just want to highlight here that when LGB, and honestly, it's LGBT youth have family support, their risk levels go way down. Um, and that's that's really, really important. The risk levels around suicidality, they tend to feel happier and more hopeful about their future when they feel extremely accepted by their families. Um, okay, I'm going to go through this really fast. I'm, I'm sorry that it's taking longer than I was expecting. Um, this is an organization, so we're thinking about tips, how to help. Um, we want to, EGAL is this wonderful organization in Canada. Um, that seems really, really committed to um, providing support services to LGBTQ folks. And they talk about in terms of allyship, breaking it down in terms of like learning as much as you possibly can, practicing this stuff again and again, and then reflecting, looking inward. And so when I think about looking inward, I think it's really important for all of us to take time every now and then to reflect on our biases. We might generally be really accepting of queer folks and if you go through and read some of these questions, you might say, oh, yeah, that applies to me. Or I, I do have that bias that I didn't really realize. If you're interested, um, Harvard has the implicit association test that you can take for free on a whole bunch of different identities. One of them is sexuality. And that can be one way to clue into perhaps some implicit bias that you may have. One of the things I want to talk about is how to respond when a loved one comes out. This is really, really important. Um, I could spend a whole presentation on this, but just a bullet list. Um, we want to be really affirming and validating. We want to say something sometimes. If you're shocked, you might just be silent. We want to avoid that silence, take some deep breaths and respond. Lead with love. That's it. That's all I really need to say. Like, Lead with love, love and affection. Watch your body language. Watch what your face is doing. Avoid jumping to questions about labels. So like, what are you, what label are you using right now? You can just sort of slow down and, and follow their lead um, using their language, um, really working to avoid any assumptions, offering as much support as, as the person is willing to accept or wants from you. Um, if you have a whole bunch of questions, 
I think it can be really nice and trauma informed to actually ask, like, I, I have a lot of questions that I'd love to talk to you about. I know you're just coming out. Would you want to talk about those questions now? Should I save those for later? Asking for permission versus sort of acting like somebody owes you a lot of information right away. Um, making sure that you don't accidentally out your child or a loved one um, without them sort of telling you what their game plan is. We don't want to out anybody. So being really mindful of that um, and just remembering what an important sort of step this is for folks and actually really can practice, um, impact their mental health. And I want you to take care of yourself. People can have, parents can have a whole host of very understandable reason, um, responses to a loved one coming out to them. And so practicing that self-validation, getting your own resources, um, really taking care of yourself is, is really, really important. I won't go through this list here, but um, this is a list of don'ts from Egal that I really, really like. And I think some of these are obvious and others are like, oh my goodness, it didn't like occur to me not to do that. So I encourage you to go on Egal's website and to take a look at this list. Um, in the family system at church, right, where all of these different systems that your child lives in, doing the best we can to, to advocate for your child. And especially if they're on board with this, you might want to have a conversation with them about what they want from you. Um, but advocate for the expectation of respect and inclusion, um, really sort of leading um, and, and using your voice and your power to, um, to stand up for your children is really important. Um, another piece that's really important is to advocate. We have so much data about how important schools are. And so really working to advocate um, for your children in their schools and to collaborate with schools. Um, you can advocate for that more inclusive curriculum, for people to move way beyond when we talk about tolerating LGBTQ folks. It makes me like sick to my stomach. We want to move way past or past tolerance towards acceptance, inclusion, embracing diversity. Um, Finding allies at school, finding that one really supportive teacher. The research shows that that can make a huge difference in people's experiences at school and their engagement with school, truancy, all sorts of factors. Um, so a number of things we can do in terms of engaging with the school. I really like this quote. When someone with the authority of a teacher describes the world and you're not in it, there's a, mo there's a moment of psychic disequilibrium as if you looked into a mirror and saw nothing. I think this just highlights how important it is for you um, LGBTQ folks to be reflected in, in the curriculum. And then we won't go through these tonight, but remembering your validation skills, all of these, these levels of validation can be incredibly helpful when someone is coming out to you, when somebody has experienced discrimination and they want to talk to you about it and they desperately need validation. I think as parents, as support systems, we often want to go towards problem solving. Like, let me talk to the school immediately. You can potentially do that but slow down and really, really try to remember your validation skills. It's really important and reinforces typically our children's desire to continue to communicate with us. And then we've got wonderful resources. A lot of these are from um, the United States, but Egal, like I said, looks like an absolutely wonderful organization in Canada. Um, these are a couple parent resources that, that I really like. PFLAG is a wonderful organization, the Family Acceptance Project, and then this book on the left. And then these are some really great uh, school resources. GLSEN is a wonderful organization um, that I recommend you look into if you want to learn anything more about um, supporting folks in schools. All right, I'm gonna stop my, there we go, my slide share. Thank you for staying with me. I know that was a lot of information or I imagine it was a lot of information. Um, I'll take some questions. It it was a lot of information and um, absolutely fascinating, and and I'm sure we we always need to hear this again about how important it is, um, how difficult it is for for youth, and how much we can do as family members and as allies. Right, that's a, a really hopeful message, in a way. So thank you so much. Yeah, we definitely have questions. So we do have some questions and, and they're really interesting. I wanna start with this one, which says, my daughter at age 13 is identifying as pansexual. I feel really strongly about this. And I'm struck by how you said 13 is the age at which most kids start to sort of identify that they, that they might be of, uh, you know, they might be able to identify their orientation. But as a parent, 13 years, like that feels like so young. How can my kid actually know this at this age? How do I take it seriously? Do I 
like, I'm sure you've heard this question before. <laughs> uh, yeah, a million times. Um, and, and of course, you know, I, I won't give advice to the specific parent about your specific child, but I'll, I'll talk about it more broadly because yes, that is like such a common question. I like to think about sexual identity development and gender de- identity development as a journey that we're all on. We're all on a journey. And sometimes on that journey, the labels we use to describe our orientation, gender or sexual orientation, they change. And I think it's so much more helpful to think about if they change, it's not that somebody was wrong. It's not that this was a phase. It's that this is what was right to them in this moment. And so generally I say, follow your child's lead. Really, really pay attention, accept, get curious. And also you don't have to practice attachment to this identity forever. I think practicing non-attachment to the outcome, if anything, we want to we wanna attach ourselves to the outcome of them finding their true selves. But I think, you know, when a 13-year-old is saying I'm pansexual, leaning in, thanking them, reinforcing what you think you need to reinforce in terms of that honest communication, the vulnerability, the tr- potentially the tremendous bravery that went into that and getting curious. And, and sometimes when parents just lean in and accept, it gives the children more freedom to just continue to explore and be open um, versus to feel like they need to dig their heels in, right? To prove something. We don't want our children to feel like they need to prove it to us. Um, so that's, that's, I think, helpful to remember. Um, but yes, the research shows like that is, that is when a lot of people tend to start to really notice these attractions and, and get curious about them. Okay. Um, and then someone else has said, my son came out to me um, and I suggested it might just be a phase, which I think is um, <laughs> on your list of don't do this. Um, <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> so now what? Um, there's another question. How do I repair the relationship with my child when the first reaction was not the best? Right. I, so I mean, right. we all make these mistakes. Right. And I think you said this at the beginning, but then what? <laughs> A hundred percent. So I do sometimes consultations with people who literally ask me the same question in a consultation. And I always, you know, I, I sort of get excited because wonderful, like you caught something, right? Not wonderful that it happened. Um, but truly you were doing the best you could at the moment. And maybe even without judgment, you were wondering, like, maybe it's a phase, like, right. You might not have had any malintent in that question. Now that you've been to this presentation, right? Now that you're learning more, this is the part of, and we have to do better. Oftentimes what can be helpful is to go back to your child and say, Hey, I went to this presentation. One, you're probably going to get really good points for that because they're seeing you put time and effort and probably emotional energy into this learning. And so that feels really amazing to queer youth oftentimes. And you'll say, they said actually did not do this. And I thought, Oh my God, this is exactly what I did that must have felt ter- like terrible to you, level three validation, right? Reading between the lines, like imagining what it might've felt like for them. That must have felt terrible to you. I'm really sorry. Would you like to talk about it? And some of them might be like, nah, it's fine. Like moving on and, and you don't need to push it then. Um, but if they want to talk about it, then they know as a parent, you're practicing and you're modeling fallibility, which we do need to model to our children. They'll make mistakes too. Um, so I would say really don't worry, um, and approach it. I think staying silent is, is a mistake, um, that we often make. Um, and so really approaching them and and just apologizing and opening the line of communication and seeing what they do with it is generally what I recommend to parents generally. Thank you. Well, that leads me directly into another question that someone has posted, which um, on one of the slides, it said silence was damaging. And you've just said that again. Sometimes being silent is the worst thing that we can do. Can you maybe say a little bit more about that? Um, Are you talking about being silent when the conversation is already an open conversation or being silent when we just don't even know, like we're kind of wondering and should we approach it with our kid? Um, I appreciate the question. I think um, sometimes I think about um, work that I've done at anti-racism. And one of the things that we'll often say is like silence is violence. And so what we mean there oftentimes is if you're not speaking up when you see injustices, if you're not speaking up when you see homophobia or racist events happening, like that silence hurts. So that's one way that I mean it. Another way is 
you know, like I'm queer. And um, every time I go to my grandparents' house, they know I'm queer. They never ask about it, right? They're just silent. So many adolescents have told me that that really hurts, that people know how they identify and that silence implies non-acceptance or it implies tolerance, but not acceptance. So that's another way that I mean it. Um, and then the other piece is, yeah, if you don't know what to say, this is where I might be, um, you know, level six validation, radically genuine and be like, oh my God, like, thank you so much for telling me. I, I have to, I have to just like call myself out. I notice I'm being really quiet right now. It's because I'm, I'm processing. I'm so grateful that you're talking to me about this, but I have so much going on in my head. I just want you to know, like, I love you. I'm really appreciative of this. I just need some time to process. So that kind of silence is okay, but I would just like call it out for what it is. I hope that's helpful, but that's a really good question. Mm -hmm. it's, well, it's helpful to me. I hope it was helpful to the person who asked the question. Um, let me just ask, there's a couple more here that are quite, quite, I think, broad. Like, how do you know when someone is part of the queer community. So supposedly somebody hasn't necessarily come out to you yet. Should we always be asking? Like, you know, I put pronouns <laughs> after my name because, you know, there's an assumption that there might be people out there, who, you know, that, that that that's going to be more inclusive. How do we how do we make it more inclusive when we, we don't know if it's needed? Like the whole presentation should have just been questions. Um, <laughs> that's another really good one. So, um, I think like we don't, right? And and that's really important is to remember that we just don't know. I think so often we assume, and this is what um, Gregory Herrick, who's a researcher who, who developed the concept of heterosexism talked a lot about is the assumption um, that heterosexuality is the norm, is is sort of the, the what we all sort of hope to be. Um, and so oftentimes we assume people are, are heterosexual and that can cause a lot of damage. So just keeping open in your language. So for example, if you don't know, and you're asking about it, somebody about like, hey, do you have any crushes? You might say, hey, do you have any crushes? You're not going to say, hey, like, have you met any boys that you think are cute? Hey, have you met any girls that you think are cute? So using more um, gender neutral language could be one, one way to go about it um, so that people don't feel you making these assumptions. Another thing to do is let's say your child is queer or your child is queer, but you don't know your child is queer or you have guesses that your child or your student are, are queer and you just don't feel like it's right yet to be like, hey, are you queer? Um, and sometimes that's not the right move. It can be helpful to just yourself talk more about LGBT identity. You might say in June, like, hey, I'm gonna go to the pride parade. Like, it looks really cool. I've never been, do you wanna come? Or, hey, I saw this movie recently. Um, is about like these, like, uh, you know, this lesbian couple who are trying to have a baby. It was so sweet. Do you want to watch it together? Basically children are constantly looking for clues that somebody is accepting. And so if you drop these clues, you may be setting, um, setting the stage for them feeling more comfortable and safer in coming out. And are that, that sounds like it's incredibly proactive Yes. And um, you're so right that, you know, we come at everything from our own perspective, right? So I'm white, I'm cisgender, I'm straight. That is my lens on the world. And, you know, it, it was, yeah, it would have been really hard when my kids were first born to think about putting myself in that sort of very proactive space, because my assumption was that it is, you know, that the world is the norm is heterosexual and straight it's the standard right. that's right. the lens through which you you know you yeah just, yeah like, so open mind to other experiences is important yeah yeah thank you and I think it's it, it really is one of those things that that we need to we need to push ourselves maybe beyond what our what our normal place is or our normal um comfort zone mm -hmm. right thank you um there was a question about how we bring in extended family members, in particular, it was grandparents, so elderly generations who may have different attitudes and and less less awareness. Um, if we have a queer kid in the family, how do we bring them on board? The, the grandparents. I think it's. I have such a like soft spot in my heart for for grandparents um, because I some of the re actually just did a talk recently for grandparents and on LGBT, LGBTQ youth. Um, I think one of the things is reminding them 
like the how actually powerful the research is in terms of what it means to have a supportive accepting specifically grandparent in an adolescent's life. I forget all the data, but I think it like can reduce depression, anxiety, feelings of loneliness, certainly, which is big in adolescence, especially during COVID. Um, so one like hide it, highlighting how important their role is, right? Um, I think that's a really good place to start. I think validating the valid, this is conf for a lot of people, not for everybody. This is confusing. This isn't the way you grew up this makes sense, right? It makes sense that this is hard for you to wrap your brain around. Like, I don't judge you for that. Leading with your own compassion and validation of what is valid is, is typically a really good place to start. And then you might, if you, if you speak DBT, use a, make a really good dear man for what exactly you're asking them to do differently. What is your assert? What are you asking for? You might say, you know, if we're talking about gender, you may provide a little bit of research data on how protective it is for people to um, be respected in terms of using the right pronouns um, and the right name, not the dead name. Um, and so you might provide that research and say like, when you're in my house, what I'm going to ask of you is to try your absolute best to always use she pronouns. Um, and that I think will help your relationship be much stronger with my child. You might also tell them what you plan to do if they don't do it. And this is where everybody has their own limits. Um, and you have to decide for yourself where your comfort zone is. Um, sometimes talking with your child, sometimes some kids are like, Ugh, whatever. And, and they don't take it too personally. And then others, actually, it's incredibly painful. And so checking in with your child about what's important to them and they can brainstorm with you about how to approach this. Um, I think uh, I think that's really important as collaborating with your child too. But so those are some of the things. And then I would say the family acceptance project. So if you Google the family acceptance project, that's some of the data I shared with you. They have like a 17 page packet or something like that that just breaks down the research on how powerful family acceptance is for reducing risk factors and mental health disparities for um for LGBTQ youth, I always give that packet to families. Um, and I think for grandparents to read it and learn is, is really helpful too. Mm. Well, that's very helpful. Thank you. I see, I see Barbara at Family Acceptance Package, just, you know, it's Family Acceptance Project. Um, okay. uh, it's just, I, I'm sure you'll still find it, but it's, uh, the citation is Ryan 2009. Okay. Great. Um, and, you know, you said to sort of take the child's lead or that the kids lead and, and really, you know, collaborate with them. And I guess what is important to them may change over time and how much they are, you know, willing to sort of deal with something or the things that are really making them feel sensitive and vulnerable might be different. And that, you know, uh, the things that they can go, eh. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. I think, I think that's a mistake we can make too is, some kids are literally like, eh, or for pronouns, they'll say any pronouns. Um, mm -hmm. And they're the ones making a much bigger deal of all of this than, than they are, than they need us to. And so I really think checking in with them and where they're at and where, where what kind of headspace they're in and what their needs are is really important. Yeah. Yeah. One of, one of my kids told me once, it's like, mom, when you get really uh, super apologetic over having made a mistake, it's like, you're making it about you, right? It's like, it becomes yeah. this really big deal. Just like you made a mistake, admit it, move on, let it go. <laughs> exactly. So that's, that's in my gender um, presentation. It's just like how to respond, like when you make a mistake and exactly like you said, Doreen, just like, oh, sorry, my bad. Like, thanks for telling me move on. Because then like, if you, if it's a massive apology, they feel like they need to take care of you. And that's so uncomfortable. Right. And, and then that's that burden piece too. Exactly. Okay. All right. Um, I, I have a couple questions about mental health pieces. If you don't mind, I'd like a, a couple more minutes. Yeah. Is that okay with you? Okay. Um, so when I heard that suicidality kind of decreases over time, this, the, the risk of suicidality for LGB youth, um, what immediately jumps to my mind is, okay, there's a solution here. There's an age at which I have to get my kid to, and then that suicidality will drop. Like, is there a, is there a peak at which the percentage or the risk is the highest? Is it, is it that simple? I know the answer is going to be no, but maybe I could yeah, speak yeah. a little bit more around that. I think what's so complicated is like from the slides you see, there are just so many different intersecting risk and protective factors. So I might think about it as more like 
what are the risk factors, pay attention to how I can help somebody learn to cope with those risk factors. So for example, if it's race, right, obviously you can't change race. There's some amazing data on um, folks who are black and Latinx, where if the family members um, provide like a stronger sense of like racial pride, right. Um, and racial socialization that can be incredibly protective, right? And so then kids are better able to deal with racist incidents and discrimination because they're having these conversations at home. And so I think like with therapists, um, with further research, figuring out what's the best way that I can cope with the risk factors that are at play right now. And then um, similarly, how do I capitalize on all of these wonderful protective factors? Um, and then I do think there is something about moving into adulthood. You know, we see this with BPD, um, as you get older and especially with treatment, of course, like the symptoms of BPD become less intense oftentimes for people. Um, and so the Trevor project, for those of you who know it, like the whole slogan is like, it gets better. And it's really conveying that message to kids that it gets better. It's very hard to deal with all of these factors when most adolescents feel insecure. Most adolescents have hormones that are raging, making it hard to think straight. Um, and so, you know, as things calm down, um, hopefully with age and, and good intervention and support, we hope that things get better. And they often do. I'm sorry, I didn't have a clearer answer to that one. That, that, that's okay. This is not this is not the kind of topic where there are clear answers. Um, I, there are a couple of questions here that, that are coming in anonymously. So I, I don't have a lot of information about um, what, what the context is. Um, but how do we, how can we support a youth where the family is unwilling to be more open, to learn more, to, to be more accepting? So assuming a, a you know, a youth yeah. that's not part of our family. Yeah. I have to say like, that's just, it's heartbreaking to me. And, and it's, and it's, you know, we want to be non-judgmental of those family members too, because they got there somehow, right. They're learning history somewhere in their learning history. Um, they learned um, these judgments, these biases um, for a host of reasons. So we don't want to judge those families and we want to then capitalize. I, I think at least part of the answer is to capitalize on other protective factors. So we know that for example, like one really solid teacher um, can make a big difference getting the children engaged in a GSA, which is at school, has nothing to do with the family, can be really protective. Having uh, LGBTQ friends, really important and helpful. Um, so really finding other resources. And this is where the internet is, a the internet is such a complicated place. We know there are so many negative impacts, um, effects of uh, social media engagement for adolescents. There's also a ton of positive um, effects of engaging in social media, especially for queer youth who find their community at times. That's often for some people where they feel the most accepted. And so if there's a responsible adult who can help them find the safe places on the internet to find community, right? Um, pushing them towards the Trevor Project, towards Glisten, towards these reputable websites. Um, th these are these are wonderful sort of resources. And then a lot of communities have online, um, like for um, online like drop-in groups where people can get support as well. Um, and so so that's another option. And some of these drop-in groups are free. Okay. Um if I could just take that one step further. So that was about, you know, a youth that's, that's not in our own family and school can provide that protective factor. Um, if there's a youth within our family, but there's certain family members, you, you really fear that they're going to be rejecting. And so there's part of the family where the youth is out and maybe one or two members where they're not out. Um, do you have anything to say? Like, how would you handle that? Do you think that it's better that a kid be out to everyone in the family, try to deal with the with the fallout and the support, um, the youth? I or think, I think this is where, you know, if you're in family therapy, it's a great family therapy discussion. Um, but consulting to the child, what does the child want? I think that's honestly the most important thing. And then the adults need to to not out the the children to certain family members that they know or, or that the kid fears. Even if you think no, no, they'll accept you, if the child's not ready, the child's not ready. 
And so I think it's just a really empowering, respectful intervention to, to look to them. Um, and if they're not sure, you can sit down and do a pros and cons. You can take time. You can make sure that you try to arrive at a wise-minded decision versus making an emotion-minded sort of heat in the moment. Okay, I'm going to do it without thinking about the consequences. Um, so DBT uh, can, can certainly be, a lot of DBT interventions I think could be helpful in slowing right. down our thinking and weighing the cons. Okay. Um, would you say that um, maybe a peer support organization like PFLAG could help family members maybe find ways that would be, would help yeah, them so find ways actually, to talk about it? Family members and for parents. Um, so so PFLAG is, is all about supporting families and, and there are so many resources on PFLAG. You know, I'll just mention too, like there's, I didn't talk a ton about the intersection of LGBT identity and, and religiosity, um, but that's a really, really important factor too. And for those who, um, who are religious, I think looking to, for communities that still support your religious beliefs and are accepting is just incredibly important. Um, and so that's another place where parents might feel like they need to advocate. Some parents feel like I need to switch churches, right? Um, and that's such a personal decision, but it is something mm -hmm. that comes up a lot. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I suppose those resources are likely in, in Canada and in the United States as well. Yeah, They're probably actually, more available, but also more available in urban centers than in smaller centers. Probably, although with COVID, you know, I think more, more, um, there's more online um, in terms of even like services online, which is really nice. Um, but I know specifically EGAL has um, some resources for thinking about religiosity um, and supporting um, LGBT youth okay. or LGBT folks in general. Great. Okay, um, I'm going to leave it there. A couple people are asking us to just um, rename the, uh, the the organizations that you've mentioned. So Egale is one in Canada, um, which I've just put into the chat. Um, Can I just thank Lori for her incredibly kind comment? Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry for interrupting you. That's great. You're the no. best. <laughs> Thank you, Laurie. Um, so Egel and PFLAG, um, we've already got the Trevor Project in there. Um, in Toronto, there's a 519 Community Center. I know there are different organizations in different cities across Canada. Um, so, and for the Metropolitan Church, I know also in Toronto is uh, specifically an inclusive church. Um, and probably there are there are churches in other locations as well. Those are all really fabulous. It's great to know that there that there are so many resources out there. And I think really the the learning is not to list all of the resources, but to know that they're there and to really go looking for them because um, you don't have to go through this kind of thing alone and, and sort of feel like you're lost and, and in the dark. So um, with that, I want to thank you so very much, Wendy. Is there maybe one last key piece of advice that you want to offer to family members that like, if you could just say like, here's, yeah. here's in a nutshell, what you yeah. need to keep in mind? Sometimes I'm just like, why, why do I, why am I in this profession? It's, it's like you sis, it's not important. You just need one thing, just lead with love. I, I think leading with love, like I, you, you could just erase the rest of the talk. Um, leading with love is, is so important. It is like backed by research. And the other piece is, I know this is complicated for some people. I think remembering you actually don't need to understand it to support, um, to support the youth in front of you or, or not even youth, like anybody in front of you who's queer. Um, those are, those are two messages I'd love to pe have people leave with. Thank you. Thank you. That's so helpful. I want to thank you for having been here with us, um, reminding everybody that uh, Dr. Bameter will be back with us on February the 1st. So please watch your emails. She'll do a presentation um, equally wonderful, I know, about gender nonconforming youth um, and how we can support them. So please join us when we do that. Before that, we will have a presentation on December the 14th, um, which will be about using DBT skills through the stressful times of the holidays and how how these skills can help us build you know more positive family member memories 
and and reduce the the stresses that we feel around this time of the year. So um, you can please join us on December the 14th. This presentation has been recorded and it will be posted on our YouTube channel and on our website at sashbear.org. And if you would like a copy of the slides, Dr. Bameter has agreed to share them. You can email programadmin at sashbear.org and we will mail them out to you in about a week's time. Um, and yes, just a reminder that we're the Sash Bear Foundation and you can find us at sashbear.org. Thank you all again and have a great evening. Thank you, Wendy, for being here with us. Take care.